question for each person. Um, so, Phil, um, you mentioned about green poverty. Um, now, for farmers in, uh, in uh, Indiana, it's an issue, you know, if productivity growth pushes down prices. Um, because they're, you, know, you can represent those farmers just with the product function. They produce, they sell. Um, but small farmers in developing many of them are close to self-sufficient in the foods they produce and sell. Um, if prices go down, they're much less likely uh, to be hurt. They may even uh, be advantaged, the net food buyers. So I, in some simulation work that I've been doing, I've found that really the poverty impacts are frequently not very sensitive to whether food prices rise or fall or don't fall in response. Um, uh, so just that's a question. Uh, is that green poverty? I, I'm, I've not seen it well documented. You know, Cochrane's treadmill... But that's, that's in rich countries. Um, uh, Usman, um, the productivity differences between different sectors, to, to really come to grips with those, I, I, I feel we need to understand why those productivity differences persist. You know, it used to be the sort of the, the sunk costs uh, model, asset fixity and so on in the rich countries, but what, what's driving it in Africa? Um, and per... Um, your case studies, there must be some really interesting examples there. What I've noticed in some African countries is it's as though policymakers haven't yet read Amartya Sen's work and they're focusing on availability. They then do the things that you, for which you criticised them. They, they put on quantitative restrictions but they don't tell the, uh, the private sector that they're going to put them on or take them off. Um, great uncertainty and increased volatility, as Tom Jane has documented in a number of papers. And, and Jan, um, uh, should it be a priority to replace imports? Shouldn't we just be looking for where the big impact uh, is? You know, if we have efficient e e economies, you know, it's not important whether it's imported or not. What's important is whether it's, it's efficient for, for its outcome. Innocent Mache, uh, African Economic Research Consortium, Director of Training. So um, I, I would have liked to hear, I mean, this is to any one of you, uh, something to do with policy harmonization or policy coordination. Uh, I, I didn't hear that coming up. Um, I just want to give you a quick example. So we, we um, at the ARC uh, with the WFP, uh, did something uh, uh, to... Um, that was, to me, very strange uh, in terms of outcome. We, you know, basically, the WFP, the World Food Program, was buying uh, uh, grains from smallholder farmers um, and assuring them, basically, of a market of quality produce. And what we noticed is that uh, usually uh, the the um, the small farm, the smallholder farmers would uh, you would expect they would side sell because the, you know they will look for the best, but but. Basically, just because there was a guaranteed market, you know, side selling was very low, and you know the quality of the product went up. But that's only because there were, you know, ancillary policies that were um, basically uh, uh, coming together to um, to you know encourage the small older farmers to uh, market through uh, uh, through through the channel that was being provided. So. You know, I would like to hear a comment on, uh, on policy coordination or, or um, alignment. The question was, your, your green poverty question, the risk of food prices going down and making producers poor. I understand that, you know, Cochrane's treadmill uh, in rich countries where, where producers produce and sell everything. But in poor countries, many poor farmers are close to self-sufficient. Many, in fact, are net buyers. Um, and in some simulation work I've done, it, it, the poverty impacts of productivity growth seem to be quite insensitive to whether food prices uh, stay constant, a small economy case, or whether they go, they go down um, because of this uh, hedging associated with the uh, net food, uh, you know, the, the, the own consumption of the, of the household. 
So I'm just wondering, that green poverty concept, is that documented uh, somewhere, real cases of that occurring, or, or, or is that more a conceptual concept? Okay, um, so it's a real phenomenon in poor countries. And, and I would cite two examples I'm very familiar with. One of, the, one of the people I was a colleague with at Purdue was Gabisa Ajita, who won the World Food Prize and, and one of his substantial contributions was improving yields of sorghum, particularly in the Sudan. Um, and he had discovered hybrid sorghum and introduced it in Sudan. And there was a period when that happened when production increased enormously over a very short period of time. Prices collapsed. The Sudanese uh, government tried to export surpluses to Saudi Arabia, but because of the price collapse, Pear Pinstrup Anderson's price response mechanism worked and farmers no longer bought uh, the hybrid sorghum. And, and that was a lesson he learned and it was clearly a problem uh, for that intervention. We've got another colleague, John Sanders, who works on improving production on the farm uh, in Mali and, and he would see the same thing happen. And so one of the things his projects involved was trying to raise poultry production uh, in Mali. And, and the argument uh, he made was that, that the demand for that was more stable and you can always reduce your poultry production and go back to eating staples if, if problems arose, but that could absorb uh, the extra production of cereals. And if you didn't have that, the price would fall. It's, it's not just a problem in uh, developed countries that, that if you saturate a market, uh, you can drive down prices and you can kill the incentives uh, for interventions. Now, now there, it doesn't always happen. And, and one of the reasons that, that we essentially emphasize the role of trade is if you open up uh, the economies uh, and allow uh, trade to uh, either get rid of surpluses or, or fill shortages, it's less likely uh, to happen. Uh, but it's a real problem that, that I think people working in this area have to worry about. Thank you, Osman. Okay, I'll be uh, very brief. Um, the uh, question on uh, innocent and policy harmonization, um, if you get a copy of the PowerPoint, uh, there's a, a couple of slides on regional trade and what you could do, for example, through policy harmonization to increase the flow. And we have some simulation to show by how much you could expand regional trade by just working on those harassment, regulatory uh, bottlenecks and other things uh, across the border. Thanks. Uh, the question, uh, I think the difference in productivity reflects difference in capital stocks and technology and skills in those different sectors. And I think that it is to be expected. Oh, the bottom one. There you go. All right. Thank you very much. Um, well, I don't know if, if policymakers have read Amartya Sen, but if they haven't, they should. Uh, but, but of course, that doesn't really help much if I'm a policymaker confronted with a whole set of other demands and a whole set of constraints. And unless we can find win-wins, and one of my win-wins, uh, which is uh, totally unacceptable and unethical and everything else, is to build into every transfer program and every program benefiting uh, low-income people an element of corruption. Where nutritionists call it leakage. Uh, take, for example, the public distribution, uh, grain distribution in India, where about half of the grain go to the intended beneficiaries and the other half uh, goes uh, who knows where. Um, I think we can probably call that uh, corruption or something like that. But the program actually works. Now, do we have to give up half of the benefits? Uh, I hope not. Um, there was a program in Colombia when I worked there that was perfectly targeted to low-income rural households. And it was to improve nutrition and reduce poverty. And it was perfectly targeted. There was virtually no leakage of any kind to anybody who, who didn't deserve to have it. And the new government came in and, of course, canceled the program. Why? Because there was no political support for it. Why should we, why should we give money 
to a group of people that has absolutely no political power whatsoever. And by the way, we don't know any of them anyway, so they're not going to do us any harm. Uh, I'm being a little facetious, but that was a real project. That, that wasn't... Um, the other question, of course, is time horizon. And um, while Amatya Sen is absolutely right on in a long-term perspective, uh, I'm only uh, elected or appointed or have appointed myself for a couple of years. And uh, I'm, you know, I'm sorry, I'm going to give fertilizer subsidies because they work next year. I'm not going to invest in uh, improved health of preschool children because by the time they grow up, uh, I'm nowhere else. So the, the whole set of political economy issues, and I can't go into to any more because then the chair is going to come after me. Mm -hmm. uh, the only other thing I want to say on the um, policy coordination, in addition to what uh, my colleague said, to Osman said, uh, is that when, when push comes to shove, uh, the national government is going to look after the national population or the groups within that are important for the national government. And I'm sorry if the neighboring government, the neighboring country is going to suffer. Uh, I can't really help that. It's no different among individuals, by the way. <laughs> yes, uh, thanks for the question. Um, obviously, I'm not anti-import. Uh, imports are needed in many situations. But in the question of wheat, for me, is it the best use of $9.3 billion of foreign exchange for a dietary pattern that may not be in the best interest of the nation? And even if we move a third of that to uh, in importing instead good irrigation equipment, uh, processing equipment, machinery appropriate for the region that improves the productivity of sub-Saharan African farmers and those products are incorporated into these products. Is that not a win-win? Uh, I'd rather, you know, most wheat in Africa, a lot of it comes from Russia. It's nice for Africans to be supporting Russian wheat farmers, but I would like to see more emphasis supporting African farmers. There's something quite interesting about the import stuff. Uh, and most of the number actually that's being cited, the $45 billion came from work we did uh, uh, a couple of years ago. Um, you look at imports, they've exploded. They've grown sevenfold when we did the research, but now four and a half times. But at the same time, African exports have grown three times. Okay? So uh, we're not in a situation where we have an import boom because agriculture is underperforming. We have an import boom because of urbanization, rising middle class, income, and population growth. Right? If you take those together, they can push demand at a double digit rate. <laughs> Agriculture as a biological process cannot grow that fast. So I'm afraid we're going to have that gap for a while. However, what it does is two things. We are now capable of feeding people because we can buy more. It used to be maybe in the 90s, we couldn't import that much and a lot of people were going hungry. So we are getting few people going hungry because we have a larger buying power and bringing imports. And second, Yes, it creates the scope for us to grow into, right? But I think it's uh, less of a problem the way it is looked at and more of a solution and an opportunity uh, in the future. Uh, if I were probably it's just the emphasis on the new value change okay. structures, it's no longer that village level stuff is really going all the way to Washington, D.C. I can buy those products, by the way, in Washington, D.C. But I would like just to uh, comment a bit on what Jan said, the uh, quality issue, the nutrition issue, okay. which, is, which is quite important. For now, I think it's more of a win at least in the case of millet. People used to eat something else. Now they're eating millet, which is much healthier. Mm -hmm. And yes, we're going to get them to do iron-fortified millet. But the quality issues, food safety issues, are going to be emerging. And you're right, we need to focus on that a little bit more. But for now, it's getting a healthy food staple on people's tables in the urban areas, which wasn't the case 20 years ago. 